Hey everyone, this is Hashem, and in this video I'm going to cover what I currently use for my street photography and for making street POV videos or travel vlogs and such. And just in case it's useful to any of you, I thought I'd put this video out there and share the gear that I currently use, what I used on my most recent overseas trip, which was to Bangladesh in December, so a month ago. And uh, I'm going to try and do this video kind of just flowing, maybe in one take or very few takes, so just keep in mind it might not be very edited, but it just makes things a bit easier for me. And uh, I'll put some chapter markers in the description in case you just want to skip to the section that concerns you. So just keep that in mind. And secondly, thanks for joining. I know it's been a little while. Welcome back to my humble little personal channel where I haven't posted in a while. But yeah, I was on holiday, things were busy, and now I'm back. And I wanted to start with this video for 2023. Third of all, what I currently use here may change, may and probably will change in the future, so just keep that in mind as well. And I do change gear sometimes. I try not to change my street photography setup uh, too often, but you know, naturally these things change. So first of all, let's address the digital gear that I've got on the table here. Some of it you might have seen in the thumbnail already. And the first um, thing I'll cover is the Canon R6. So I sold my Fujifilm X100V and I bought a Canon R6 in the recent months. Reason being was that I had been meaning to invest in a new Canon full frame body to replace my aging 6D Mark I. The camera that I bought when it was brand new, when it first came out, was getting pretty old. I use it for my wedding and other client work. It was time for an upgrade and I intend to slowly transition into Canon's mirrorless line, which is, looks like the way things are going. My other main Canon camera is the 5D that I'm filming on right now. So this pairs with it perfectly. And because I splashed so much money on that, and I now have a digital mirrorless camera that's a Canon, I thought there was not so much point keeping the Fuji film as well. As much as I love that camera, it was a great camera. I um, capitalized a little bit on the hype surrounding it recently, admittedly, sold it for what I paid for it roughly and um, got my money back and put that money towards this 35 mil RF 1.8, which pairs with this camera to make it similar in terms of the same focal length as the Fuji film X100V albeit being bigger and bulkier, it's still not too bad. You know, even without the lens, it's pretty light and slim. I can put a smaller lens, adapt one of my Leica lenses onto it. Uh, but with this lens, it makes a monster for, uh, you know, filming as well, because it has stabilization in the lens. The camera has IBIS advantages over the Fujifilm already. It's full frame. I prefer the files out of it. I did like the Fujifilm X100V files, but I, I just prefer the Canon files. I don't know if it's familiarity, but yeah, I'm loving this camera so far, and it was just a logical thing for me to sell off the X100V, just not to have too many things that cross over. So that's what I use for uh, digital street. If I am gonna shoot street, I know it's a little bit bulky with this setup, but it's not too bad, like I said. And I've already experimented with shooting this on the street with some of my adapted Leica lenses, and I shot this overseas with this lens, which was fantastic, good for low light, and I use this mainly for color on my Bangladesh trip and um, it makes a great camera for vlogging. So this is what I use now for filming the B-roll that you might see in some future videos and some that have already come out. Uh, because it's stabilized, it makes life a lot easier. It has the great flippy screen and some other features that come in handy for, for doing video. And uh, yeah, it's been performing well. I'm yet to release some of those Bangladesh vlogs, but if you want, you can check back on my Pushing Film channel. So when shooting street in Bangladesh, I was using this mainly for color and low light. And the second camera I was using was the Leica MA 35mm film camera. So that is my daily driver, so to speak, the camera that I use mainly for my street photography. I had um, 10 rolls of HP5 with me on this last trip and I was mainly shooting that black and white film through this camera. I won't go into too much detail about this camera. I feel like I talk about it a lot, but if you are interested, I've got a whole review that I just launched on my other channel, Pushing Film where I go into depth about why I like this camera, why I use it, what I think is good about it, why it's not really for everyone. I wouldn't recommend it for most people, but it's what works for me. I've been shooting Leica rangefinder for years now. I had an M4 prior to this. And uh, yeah, uh, if you wanna see some results I've shot with the camera, I'll put a gallery in the, a link to a gallery in the description that was paired up with my recent review on the camera. So shooting the Leica MA for film, especially black and white on this recent trip, but that can change. I did shoot some color as well. And using the Canon R6 for digital photography and for video. Now for POV, I've switched over to the DJI Action 2. I sold my GoPro because it was pretty old as well as a Hero 5, which was aging. 
didn't have very good stabilization and I got a great deal on this for about a hundred and something between 150 and 200 Australian dollars which is dirt cheap for what this can do. That was including this power module which makes it really versatile in the way that you can use it. I can just magnetically you know clip this on to my shirt using this magnetic lanyard and it's just a really versatile system. It has lower battery life uh, especially with the standalone unit and storage but then it does pair nicely with this to transfer the internal memory to the SD card here to recharge the battery and it works really well for what I do for the short stints of POV photography and I've already shared a video on, on pushing film where I shot with the MA in Melbourne and did POV with that DJI action too. So I sold the GoPro and that funded pretty much half of the brand new price for this and again that included the power module and this like magnetic protective case and I love the quality upgrade that I've noticed so far from getting this um, new POV camera. So that's what I use to film my, my vlogs and POV footage. For audio, I would either use the built-in audio on this, which is actually quite decent, big step up from the GoPro that I had. But if I was filming with this, I would attach the Rode Wireless Go, sorry about this noise, which is actually what I'm using one of right now. It's the Rode Wireless Go 2 and I'm sure you're familiar with how these work. I've currently got one of them hooked up to a lapel, uh, but that just makes a great travel companion for audio because it's compact. You can just wear it. It's great for dynamic situations where you're moving around. And even if I just want to sit down and do some talking bits, it will suffice. It's not as clear as maybe a dynamic mic or a shotgun, but for travel, you want things that are light and that worked really well. So yeah, I had this 35 mil lens attached to that for the majority of the time. I had the 28 mil, and maybe the 35 uh, on the Leica, but mostly 28, and the Zeiss 35mm Biagon 2.8 is the other lens I used a lot. And I had a third lens, which was this Zeiss Sonar 50 f1.5, which I still use. I didn't use it as much as the other two, but this came in handy for a lot of shots where I wanted compression or maybe doing some portraits. And as I mentioned, the great thing is I can just adapt these now that I have a mirrorless Canon, uh, to, to that camera. So I can use my Leica M lenses with you know, flawless results just by using this little uh, adapter, this Earth M to RF adapter, and use those lenses on the Canon. So that was my photography setup. Those were the cameras, the lenses, the action cam for the straps. Ever since my Nikon FE, I got a tap and die strap, and these two straps are both by tap and die. The black one was married to the Canon R6, and the brown one was with the Leica MA, and that's how I tend to use these. I might switch back to using a Peak Design or Earth Strap with this, because I find these metal rings don't play so nicely with the composite plastic body, the way it's designed. But yeah, I really like using them for smaller cameras like the Rangefinder and you know heavy metal cameras like the Nikon FE. So I've covered audio, video, the straps, and uh, I've got some little accessory packs here, little leather pouch for three rolls of film, this fake Pelican knockoff um, SD card holder, nothing too special there. I'll see if I can find Amazon links for that SD card case. And the light meter, which I had handy in case I needed it, was this Iconic L308S Flashmate, it's called. Handy to have just in case, as you will see in other content if you haven't already. I don't use a meter with this, it doesn't have a meter built in, so I use Sunny 16 and just, uh, you know, get the exposure in my mind before taking the shot. So I pre-meter using Sunny 16, set up those settings and then take the shot normally. But I would sometimes have this with me in standby, especially if I had the backpack, in case I had the time to slow down, take a couple of readings and really study the light. So that's that. And uh, yeah, let's go to the bags now. So the smaller bag that I would use is this Honor Bowery, which I've spoken about on the channel before. It was in my 2022 EDC video, Essential Daily Carry, and I've had this for ages, as I've mentioned. It's really worn out pretty well now. It's still holding up well, but it's starting to finally have some little holes in it. But yeah, it still works fine. And yeah, I've currently taken the strap off that, but it's just a shoulder strap bag, which is handy for taking out for smaller little walkabouts where I wouldn't want to take too much gear. Perhaps it's just one camera and a couple of extra lenses and some film. Maybe it's um, both cameras with the single attached lens, and that's a great thing if I want, I can actually fit both of those cameras in this bag and even an extra lens and some film and other things in the pockets. It fits quite a bit when the cameras are fairly compact like these. So that would be for 
light duty usage, but then if I wanted more room, if I was going out for longer and I want less strain on my back because you'll get less strain by wearing a backpack over both shoulders, I would take this back, um, backpack by PackSafe. That's a mouthful. But yeah, I bought this backpack when I was traveling to uh, Lebanon, Turkey and Europe uh, in the middle of last year. And if you're familiar with PackSafe, they have these bags with a few little security functions like the, you know, the mesh wiring that stops people from just knifing the bag as easily, has some, you know, locking features on the zips on that. It really it would seem convoluted if you're not used to it, way to unzip the bag, just to give it a bit of extra layer of security and other little um, security functions. It has great compartments inside the spot for a passport with the RFID thing. I'm not too fussed about all that. And I know that when you're traveling into some countries where you have high risk of pickpocketing, um, you know, you can only really mitigate the risk. Having this backpack isn't really gonna stop someone if they really wanna mug you and take all your stuff. But I think the best practices are to just mitigate the risk as much as possible. And the primary way to do that is to just be aware of where you're going, be aware of your surroundings and study up, you know, the place and just, yeah, just don't do silly things if you can avoid it. And um, then an extra layer would be to mitigate some of that risk by not making things tempting for, for potential pickpockets and making their life just a little bit harder perhaps with some of these security functions that I liked about this PackSafe bag. Uh, when I was in Naples, for example, I heard that it was a notorious place for pickpocketing and I just had that bit of extra peace of mind when I was there and um, wherever else I might have traveled, Lebanon, Turkey, Bangladesh, whatever, there's not really too much risk, but it just gives you that little bit of extra layer of security in case that concerns you. Um, but yeah, it's not a camera bag, so it just looks like a normal bag, which is good, I guess. And I sometimes would put this inside there, which would fit, so I would actually have that as an insert. With the strap off, this works as an insert and can be used in there if I want it, or I can just have one camera in a, a beanie or whatever and some extra clothes, food, water, whatever I might want to take. This bag would be good for those longer trips, the day trips or any overnight trips or anything like that, where I'm walking around a lot and want to take more gear. So I'll be taking both cameras when I'm taking this backpack, taking extra lenses, the microphones, whatever else. So that would be what I would use for that. All right, so uh, I think I've covered everything that I wanted to cover in terms of what I used most recently, what I'm currently gonna use if I do a similar trip. But yeah, be aware, some of this might change. I might change some of these things and um, update in a future video. And one last thing I thought would be worth covering is shoes. Shoes are really important when you're doing a lot of street photography. And the latest pair that I found really comfortable because I've had a lot of shoes that are kind of somewhat comfortable or not so comfortable and your feet do get sore if you're walking around for hours a day doing street photography. So I thought it'd be important to maybe share that. These are the Zero shoes, the Zero Prio. So it's X-E-R-O, I'll put a link in the description. And these are barefoot minimalist style shoes that might look a little bit dorky, but they're comfortable because they're more anatomically shaped. They've got a wider toe box, they have zero drop, um, they're a little bit thin on the cushioning, so that's something that if you're not used to, you need to transition into by wearing these shoes only occasionally or putting a thicker insole in them. But yeah, I just thought I would share that because I'm, I've been transitioning to, to wearing more and more of these minimalist style shoes uh, for years now. And for me, it was a little bit easier of a transition because I did walk around barefoot a lot as a kid and I slowly transitioned using a cheaper Amazon pair, just wearing it to the gym or short walks during um, you know, COVID lockdowns. And I had another pair, the Vivo Barefoot, which are thinner and less cushioned than these. But what I like about the Zeros is that they have a decent amount of cushioning if you are just not wanting a completely minimal experience walking around all day. And I just put some slightly thicker insoles than the ones that came with the shoes because those were a bit flimsy. So I replaced those. Uh, but yeah, there's other models out there that have maybe thicker cushioning if you want to slowly transition into that part. But what is important is having that that wider toe box, it just gives you so much more comfort. In my experience, I have wider feet and uh, I always struggled with the idea of shoes that were pointy or narrow or, you know, Chuck Taylors, as cool as they look. And I used to love the idea of wanting to wear them. They were just never comfortable for long periods of time. Even Vans are kind of okay, but they get uncomfortable after hours of walking. New Balance are great in terms of cushioning and width, but they sometimes do get a bit narrow and they have too much of a, a raised heel, so you get some discomfort there. And um, yeah, I think minimalist shoes from Zero and Vivo Barefoot and some of those kind of brands are the way to go. 
I'm not affiliated with them. I'll put an Amazon link if I find one to this model, but I definitely recommend um, giving them a try if you're open to that kind of thing. Watch some other videos about it if you're new to it. So yeah, that's pretty much the video. That's the stuff I would take with me. That's the small bag, the big bag. I could put some water in there and everything. And it all made a fairly compact setup. And this actually doubled as my carry-on bag when traveling between airports and such. So um, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. One thing that could be worth mentioning is just this little um, Kodak Do Not X-Ray bag that I used for the film that I took with me, the you know 15 rolls I think that I took on this last trip. But this is not available for sale unfortunately so I wasn't sure if I would share it. I got this as a gift from Kodak when they sent me the Kodak Gold 200 sample pack back when that came out. It is really cool and you know it helps a little bit when if you're going to ask for an x-ray check which I only did at the Melbourne airport since I have a CT scanner but yeah that's the other thing I had on the table. That's what I've got for you in this video. If there's any other specific questions you have about my current gear for street photography, POV, vlogging etc just uh, drop it in the comments. Thanks for tuning into this one. I hope you got something out of it if you do something similar. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. All right, bye.